Well, hello, everybody, and thank you all for joining us for our lunchtime chat with Clinkett and Haida. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Peterson. My Clinkett name is Chakya Ish, and I serve as the president of Clinkett and Haida. Uh, we're so excited uh, to be with you this week after uh, the new year to uh, bring you uh, the latest information on uh, how to apply for funding. So. You know, the, the weekly lunchtime chats are an opportunity to share information with our tribal citizens on Clinkett Haida's recent and upcoming activities, our programs and services. Each chat will include a question and answer period and close with a random door prize drawing. So to be entered in for that drawing, just make sure you hit like on the, the comments section. And uh, please feel free to uh, put your questions in the comments section. We try to get to all of them. I, I do expect today's lunchtime chat will be somewhat short, um, but uh, we, you know we set the whole hour aside, so we'll plan on that. Should we go that long? But if not, please you know give us all your questions. Um, for this week's lunchtime chat, we've been joined by 477 Director William Martin and TANF Manager Jesse Parr. Um, they're here to share information on our financial assistance programs, specifically our temporary assistance for needy families and our general assistance program. Um, you know, understanding many of our tribal citizens right now remain unemployed or have been laid off due to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, we felt it was important for us to highlight again our two most important programs that could provide financial relief to individuals and families. These programs exist to help with essential needs such as food, clothing, shelter, and utilities, depending on eligibility. We have several longstanding programs and services that are available to provide financial relief to our tribal citizens and any Alaska Native or American Indian that resides in our service area. These programs are crucial to our tribal citizens right now and are the essential programs we have in place to help our tribal citizens and families through the coronavirus pandemic. Now, while I say during the coronavirus pandemic, these, these are um, ongoing standing uh, programs. So they really don't have anything to do with the CARES Act. So uh, I would ask you to limit your questions to these programs. Um, and before we jump into the interview questions, I just wanna convey that I know there are many tribal citizens in need that are not in our service area. And for that reason, we will be sharing some resource links towards the end of our chat for those who reside in Anchorage, Washington, or California, which are areas where we know there are high populations of our tribal citizens. And unfortunately, these programs are de designated for the service area. Uh, Will and Jesse, can you please introduce yourself? Will? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Will Martin. I am the 477 Division Director, and I am very proud to say that I have been in this position for five years now and I have enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, my Clinket name is Key Gon, and I am originally from Cake, uh, and I'm very happy to join everybody here today. Great, Jesse. Thank you, President Peterson. Um, yeah, my name is Jesse Parr. Uh, I was born and raised here in Juneau. Uh, I've been in my current position as a TANF program manager for about two and a half years, and I'm, uh, I'm really enjoying it. And I'm really looking forward to the pandemic ending as well and uh, you know, kind of getting back to business as normal. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, Will, can you talk about the general assistance that uh, referred to as a GA program? What does the application process look like? What documents are necessary to apply? And do you have to reapply at the beginning of each month? Okay, absolutely. Uh, the General Assistance Program uh, provides financial assistance uh, for four basic needs uh, for individuals who find themselves uh, in uh, dire straits. So the General Assistance Program covers the basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. Uh, the General Assistance Payments are only to be used for those four uh, uh, needs. And... Uh, we will verify uh, uh, actual monthly expenses amounts. So we, we will make sure that uh, we help you in those areas. And talking about the application process, 
Uh, once you submit an application, uh, intake technician will uh, look over that application, make sure that all the information on there is correct. Uh, if there is missing information, that, uh, that intake technician will contact uh, the applicant to verify uh, further information before that application goes to one of our caseworkers to uh, determine eligibility. Uh, documents necessary to apply include uh, bank statements. If you have a, a bank account, so we need to verify income. Uh, if, you, if you are employed part-time uh, or you're underemployed and have uh, uh, low uh, salaries, uh, we'll ask for your pay stubs. Uh, we need to verify where you live. So we'll need some sort of uh, verification of, of your residence. And we'll also need to know if you are uh, a member of a federally recognized tribe, or if you're a member of Central Council Click and Hide Us, and we'll look at that. Uh, as to whether you need to reapply each month, uh, no, once you submit your initial application, uh, each month you'll need to prove your continued eligibility, but you will not need to submit a whole new application. Uh, once you are assigned to a caseworker, a caseworker will work with you uh, each month to uh, determine continued eligibility and assist you with other services that you'll need. Great, thank you, Will. Can you um, explain how the general assistance program is funded? Yes, the, our general assistance is funded through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, it is a portion of a, our 477 plan uh, so we, we uh, request uh, GA to be included in our 477 on our three-year cycle. Uh, that funding uh, is based off of uh, compact communities. That means that any communities that we have uh, agreements with uh, to uh, receive and distribute those fundings on behalf of those communities. Uh, so that's how we uh, receive our funding and that's how we uh, distribute our funding. So what communities are served under the GA program? We currently have eight compact communities. So there are eight communities that have uh, compacted with Central Council Click and Hyda uh, to, uh, to administer the general assistance on their behalf. Those communities include Craig, Haynes, Juno, Kassan, Pelican, Saxman, Tinneke, and Wrangell. So why are some Southeast Alaska communities not served by us? So some of those, uh, some of the communities, those communities that are not served by us through our general assistance program is mainly because uh, they have not entered into a compact agreement with Central Council. Uh, to administer uh, those services and those programs on their behalf. So those communities that have chosen not to, uh, I think communities like uh, Ketchikan and Sitka, Huna, some of the others, uh, if I right. missed, it's because they operate them themselves, right? Correct. Uh, they, they have chosen to operate their general assistance program uh, for themselves. So they uh, they handle uh, the programs uh, directly to their tribal citizens. Great. Um, so if you're living outside of Southeast Alaska for school or because of COVID implications, can you still apply? Uh, unfortunately, if you are outside of uh, our service area, uh, that's not something that we would be able to uh, uh, do. However, if they are outside of our service area specifically because of COVID and they, and they are planning to return, uh, that is an exception that we can make and we should be able to assist in, in those uh, situations. And does that apply for students as well? No, uh, students, those who are going to secondary, uh, post-secondary education, uh, that does not apply to them. So they are able to apply for and receive general assistance services uh, through, our, through our higher education 
uh, department that's located in the Vocational Training and Resource Center. Okay. So can you elaborate on what, what the eligibility requirements are? Yes. Uh, the basic uh, eligibility requirements include uh, a person has to be enrolled with Clinton and Haida, or they have to demonstrate proof of eligibility for enrollment, or they can provide a certificate of Indian blood from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, they have to reside in one of the communities that uh, we mentioned earlier, the, uh, one of the compact communities, uh, and they have to show that they uh, have insufficient, res insufficient resources uh, or income to meet their basic needs. Um, so what would be considered um, having insufficient resources? Well, if they don't have enough, uh, we do have income and resource guidelines. Uh, so uh, that threshold is, is pretty low. So uh, it, it really depends on uh, uh, whether the applicant is applying for themselves or if they have a significant other uh, or if they have a, uh, a child and they no longer um, are eligible for, for TANF, uh, that amount will, be, will vary based on those uh, uh, situations. So what is the goal of general assistance? Well, the primary goal of our general assistance program is to assist those who come to us uh, improve the quality of life and, and eventually reach self-sufficiency. So we provide a variety of case, manage, case management services uh, that will help them reach that goal of self-sufficiency. Uh, our primary goal is to help them get a job, get a, uh, a job that will uh, take care of all of their basic needs uh, and they can stand on their own two feet. So uh, our primary goal is to guide them in that uh, plan to reach self-sufficiency. Gotcha. So Will, outside of the financial assistance, what are some of the other support services clients can receive through GA? Okay, uh, so general assistance, we can provide case management and resource referral services. So uh, once an uh, application is approved and a person is determined eligible for general assistance, they will be assigned to a caseworker who will work closely with them and uh, in, in helping them uh, reach their goal of self-sufficiency. And we can help them uh, connect with other resources that will help them in other needs that we might not be able to uh, assist with. We also help with supportive services so we can help them uh, connect with uh, child care assistance. We can help them with transportation. Uh, we can help with, some, with the limited uh, health needs uh, such as medical, dental, or optical that is not covered under Medicaid or Medicare. Uh, and then we can help them with work-related items and maybe a shelter subsidy if, if they need that. So a little bit uh, expounding on work-related items. So if a person gets hired to be a carpenter uh, and they don't have any carpentry tools, we can assist with that. Uh, if they get uh, hired and they don't have uh, adequate work clothing, we can assist with uh, adequate work clothing. Uh, if, they are, uh, if they have a job interview and they don't have uh, interview clothing, we can assist with that because we understand that first impressions are most important so we want to do everything we can to assist them uh, be as successful as possible as they move towards self-sufficiency and employment. Can, can you um, expand on what it does not cover? Yes, general assistance does not cover credit card debt. Uh, we don't cover loans. We don't cover bills. Uh, we don't cover fines. Uh, so if somebody has uh, a traffic fine and that's holding them up from getting their driver's license. We cannot cover the fine. Uh, however, we could cover the cost of them getting their license, but they would have to cover the fine themselves. Uh, these services and these cash assistance, cash assistance is only to be used to pay uh, verified actual monthly expenses. Again, we're going back to the food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. Right. 
if our tribal citizens have uh, more questions on how to apply, who can they contact? Uh, we do have a uh, employment and training uh, uh, email address, so they can they can uh, go to that or go to the uh, Central Council uh, website. And as you can see there, we also have applications available at our website, which is you can see at the bottom. So uh, you can go there and then there, there are other uh, uh, ways of, of getting a hold of us that are also located on that website. Great. Jesse, turning to you, can you talk to us about the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, uh, at Clinton Height has been operating program for 20 years, or it was 20 years this past July. Uh, we provide monthly cash assistance and supportive services to low-income families or adult not included families. Uh, single and two-parent families can receive assistance for up to 60 months. Uh, and we're hoping that, you know, obviously it takes less than that, but our, our ultimate goal is to uh, help families become self-sufficient and uh, save the world, as I like to sum it up. Great. What does the application process look like? What documents are necessary for applying? So we have uh, TANF offices in Juneau, Ketchikan, and Sitka. Um, and then we also partner with the Division of Public Assistance and other tribal governments uh, where we don't have offices to get applications via email, fax, et cetera. Um, I've got four eligibility staff that work on processing monthly benefits and the actual eligibility for applications and services. Uh, I've got two staff here in Juneau and then uh, one in Ketchikan and one in Sitka as well. Um, we, you know, kind of the basic overview is that uh, we need to have one household member of the, you know, the TANF assistance unit or TANF family uh, that's enrolled in a federally recognized tribe. So um, obviously we have over 30,000 individuals that are enrolled in Klingon Haida, but we also uh, can service anyone that's enrolled in any of the uh, many federally recognized tribes. Uh, and so we can get proof of that in a number of ways. Uh, we also uh, need to comply with child support. So if there's any non-custodial parents, we need to uh, try to address that, address child support for that child and also to, or make a valid claim for good cause. Uh, we also have to uh, prove that the family's under the income and resource limits for their household size and uh, household composition. So for the vast majority of our families, the resource limit is $2,000. Uh, and the income limits were actually uh, established before TANF was authorized and then adjusted um, on an annual basis for most years that there was a social security uh, adjustment. But uh, the income limits are really similar to the food stamp or SNAP program. Uh, so we just need to prove that families are uh, low income. Uh, we can do that in a number of ways. If people are working part-time, uh, we can get pay stubs from their employer, an employment statement. Uh, we also uh, have a you know, link to the Department of Labor's uh, database to verify if people are receiving unemployment. That's a very common way. Um, and then we can also you know, use bank statements or other proof of information. Great. Can, can you talk a little bit about how TANF is funded? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've got two main grants that we're funded under. We receive about a, a $2.5 million grant from the state of Alaska's Department of Health and Social Services, and then about a $2.3 million grant from uh, the Administration of Children and Families Office of Family Assistance um, for our federal TANF. And so we've been, uh, you know, flat funded essentially since 2000. So it's been a uh, we, we try to you know, save the world as best we can with uh, what we have. Right. What communities does TANF serve? So uh, TANF in Alaska, the travel programs that are eligible are all broken into the uh, different uh, ANSA regions. So for us, we serve all of Southeast Alaska, the Sea Alaska region, uh, with the exception of Metlakatla. Um, okay. Um, so if you're living outside of Southeast Alaska for school or because of COVID, can you still apply? Uh, you can apply and we have some uh, allowable absences, real similar to what Mr. Martin previously discussed. Uh, really the allowable absences uh, are 
focused around either medical or educational purposes or you know, programming needs that are not available uh, in your home community. Uh, so for a lot of families, um, you know, there's special education programs, whether it's a dental school or uh, things like that that aren't available in Southeast. Uh, also, there's a number of medical services that aren't available in Southeast where people need to reside outside of um, their home community for a long time. As long as they have the intent to return, we're, we're happy to serve those families. Okay. Who, who can apply for Canada? Um, any family that has a child under the age of 19 um, and has at least one federally enrolled household member. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what the eligibility requirements are for Canada? Um, yeah. And so the, we have income uh, guidelines that go along with uh, the household size. And again, those are real similar to the food stamp program. Um, and also people that are, you know, families where someone is working part-time, um, I realize the income limits are low, but we, we don't count uh, every dollar for dollar. So we allow earned income deductions uh, to try to really incentivize working and uh, to try to help those uh, in families that are on the thresholds of poverty. Um, and we, you know, we kind of, uh, we also, Try to, or we're making our best effort to really try to be as paperless as possible. So we'll try to make collateral contacts to justify and verify all sorts of information, whether it's um, you know, rental expenses, uh, income, et cetera. And so we're doing our best to partner and try to really make an effort to do things electronically and via email and via phone call. Okay. Um, how much assistance is provided? Uh, so again, it, it depends on your household size and, uh, and the household type. So we have, uh, but the, the actual monthly payment amounts were established uh, before TANF was authorized. So in October of 1993, and they, uh, they have been in uh, state statute since those times. So um, the most common household size and household type is a, a single parent with one child. And uh, the monthly benefit for that household type and size is $821. Uh, and those are kind of again established in federal and state law. And, um, we also uh, provide supportive services that are um, discretionary depending on the family situation. So uh, we'll help out with uh, you know rental or eviction notices, uh, trying to help people get into new housing. Uh, again, kind of echoing what Mr. Martin said earlier, if people have a job interview and need a shirt and tie, we'll set them up, you know, help them out there. Uh, work clothing or tools for, in a carpenter situation. Uh, really, you know, we try to help out in any way possible uh, to to make the family self-sufficient. Great. Are families issued support on a month-to-month -month basis? Uh, so we again, we have kind of the monthly benefit, as I spoke of, like over eight hundred twenty-one dollars, and then we'll have uh, supportive services on a more discretionary month-to-month -month basis. Uh, if someone is, you know, say attending a school or working part-time, we'll try to help them out with a monthly gas stipend or a monthly bus pass, uh, things like that. Or, you know, obviously if they have an interview and need, uh, you know, interview clothing for that interview, that's kind of a one-time thing. So it really um, kind of just depends on the situation and the client's family self-sufficiency plan, which is real similar to the uh, individual self-sufficiency plan, but we also are trying to address the whole family and, uh, you know, the, the children's needs for child care or um, the uh, transportation needed to get the adult to whatever work activity they need to do to, to become self-sufficient. Right. So generally, how long does it take before assistance is received after an application is processed and all the supporting documents are received and approved? We really strive to make sure that we stay under a month from the time the application is received. Uh, again, and we're we're striving to you know really make every effort to to reduce the paperwork burden on the applicant. That's kind of our, our ultimate goal, and we're making an effort to do that prior to the pandemic. And it's becoming even more important now that the pandemic is hit, and you know, not just our offices are closed to the public, but uh, but many of the public facilities, whether it's a library, a tribal government, everything. Uh, we do have drop boxes in our offices in Judo, Ketchikan, and Sitka. 
people are able to actually you know get the hard copy documents but we're trying to make that extra phone call uh, and things like that whether it's calling an employer or uh, calling a landlord etc to try to get the verification on behalf of the client and reduce the amount of paperwork that they need to provide all right are, so have there been any um changes to our applications with covid um not the application itself we're, we're currently working on an updated application there but we've uh, what we've tried to do is to actually help the client fill out the application or uh, complete it over the telephone we've mailed applications uh, where we used to get a shelter statement in some instances we've gone ahead and uh, not required that document we've you know made phone calls to the to the landlord etc so it, it, uh, and again we have uh, you know, a number of clients that will live in Alaska housing and so it's real easy for us to you know call them on a regular basis whether it's the Alaska Housing Development Corp or the Alaska Finance Corp but uh and so it, it does uh depend on the situation but we're we're doing every making every effort to reduce the burden great so again if tribal citizens have questions on how to apply who can they contact um, and the email on the screen there that belongs to Julie Chapman, and uh, I commonly refer to her as uh, the real boss. She kind of runs the show, and I try to uh, fill in where I can. Um, but also, you know, the phone number 463-7158 is a great number. Uh, and then my direct line is 907-463-7344, and it's uh, forwarded to my cell phone at all times. So uh, anyway, you can reach out and get a hold of me, and I can explain any situation. Great. Thank you, thank you for that information, uh, both Will and, and Jesse. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we get a lot of questions about because so many of our tribal citizens do not live within the service area. And of course, we don't define the service area, the funder does. Um, <clears throat> but we know that there are many tribal citizens in need that, again, aren't in our service area. And unfortunately, due to the federal funding restrictions, many of Clinton Haida's services are only available to individuals and families that are Alaska Native or American Indian and reside within our service area, which is Southeast Alaska, with the exception of a few village tribes that operate their own programs. This is an unfortunate reality of administering restricted funds and an issue Clinton Haida is working diligently and very hard to address by generating unrestricted revenues through our tribal business enterprises. We really encourage you to apply for our CARES Act financial assistance programs if you've been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic and also reach out to the tribe that is nearest to you as many administer the same programs and provide services such as Clink and Haida and should be able to assist all Alaska Natives or American Indians in their service area and you'll notice we keep saying if you're also American Indian, because these programs, you don't have to be enrolled with Clinton and Haida, you just have to be enrolled with the tribe. Um, I also want to point out that uh, we will be making an announcement soon on the CARES Act um, program, the assistance. You know, we had the December 30th uh, deadline from the uh, federal government to have those monies. Uh, expended and then we got a um, continuance on that through this year. So we'll be making an announcement on uh, resuming applications and we've been processing all the ones that were submitted. And so uh, I, th I think that's good news there for folks. Um, again, I wanna just uh, share my appreciation to Will and Jesse for being here today. I'd like to now just turn to uh, open up questions from our public and remind you again, again, every week we do the door prizes. So if you haven't yet, go like uh, the this on the discussion and you'll be entered in for the door prizes. I'm looking at our questions now um, from Trudy, Trudy Swink. Is it all of Washington state that TNH helps? Unfortunately, I think I just answered that it's it's really not any of Washington State that uh, qualifies for these two programs we talked about today. So uh, from Margaret Hobb, are these applications online and are they fillable online? I know that they are 
available online? I don't know, uh, Will, can you answer? Are they fillable online? Uh, yes, sir. I believe they are fillable online. So they, they will be, uh, so you'll be able to fill that out uh, on your computer. Right. Uh, it's not necessarily an online application. It's a PDF, but it's a fillable PDF that you can fill out. And uh, I'm not sure if it's signable online or not, but if not, you can always print it and, uh, and then get it to us that way. And one of the questions that we get often is a lot of our, our folks may not have internet access to even get online. Um, I believe then they can just call our 1-800 numbers and we'll mail the applications to them. Is that correct? Absolutely. We'll, we'll either mail that to them or we can fill it out for them online uh, while they're on the phone line. Uh, uh, depending on their situation. So we, we uh, approach that on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are times when we can not actually help them fill it out uh, while they're on the phone. Great. Yeah. Um, from Char LeMay Hill, can I get general assistance in Anchorage? Um, not from us, but I think you can go to South Central Foundation. Is that right? Uh, I believe you can go to South Central. Foundation, where you can go to Cook Inlet uh, Child Council, I believe also uh, provides general assistance services. Okay. Uh, I think this is from Rayanne Holmes. Is transportation covered in services that general assistance provides? Transportation would be considered a supportive service. So if a uh, recipient of general assistance has need of transportation, we can assist them with uh, either a gas voucher if they have their own vehicle or can help them with uh, a bus, bus pass. Uh, on very limited uh, basis, we do have a, uh, a company vehicle, so we, uh, we may be able to assist there uh, a one-time uh, transportation uh, with, our, with our vehicle. Okay. Um, this question is from Eugene Natsong. Do you have assistance for disabling wheelchair person needing help doing an errand and clean house and help disabled in daily life? Will? Uh, no, uh, that is not what the general assistance is for. We do have, we do provide a cash assistance for those who are temporarily disabled, but if you're looking for a longer term uh, assistance, we do have a tribal vocational rehabilitation program. Uh, but, but again, that is also designed uh, with a final goal of employment. Uh, but if you contact us, uh, I'm sure we can, you can, we can talk to you about it and we can steer you in the right direction and get you uh, towards the resources that, that would best help your needs. So uh, from Jessica Domini, what about those families who live permanently outside of Southeast Alaska? What do they do for TAN? Again, I, I think that Jessica, the answer there is that um, those programs are administrated by tribes. So you'd have to go to a tribe that you live near and they should have to serve you because they, um, the program requirements aren't limited to um, being enrolled with that tribe, just being tribally enrolled. Uh, Jesse or Will, you wanna, did I answer that correctly? Uh, yes, uh, if you are permanently outside of our service area, which is Southeast Alaska, whether you're Anchorage or Fairbanks or down Washington or lower 48, um, you'll need to apply to the tribe that's closest to you. If you don't know what that is, uh, you can contact us and we will find out uh, what tribe uh, will provide those services that live that are closest to where you live and we'll, we'll do our best to connect you to them. Great. Uh, from Marvin Willard, what percent became become self-sufficient with the TANF program? Jesse, do you have those statistics? Uh. No, and uh, it's not really a statistic that we capture um, as far as overall self-sufficiency. Um, we 
we do capture work participation rates uh, and over 60% of our um, households that are required to do work participation rates are, are meeting those rates. Uh, actually, just this week I um, got our the previous federal fiscal year and we you know, maintained uh, high work participation rates the entire time. But uh, as far as an actual complete uh, self-sufficiency um, measurement, we don't capture that. And uh, to be perfectly honest, self-sufficiency can be defined differently depending on um, the person or you know um, how how the reviewer might you know want to say what is self-sufficient. Um, I still get a lot of help from my parents, if that, or from my mom and uh, sisters, if that's any uh, uh, good kind of. <laughs> Comparison, so I, I I never could say that I'm fully self-sufficient, but I'm, I'm over in comfort, Anna. All right, from Lori Carrick, what about the children who are in their grandparents' custody? Are payments for TANF different? Uh, correct, and uh, for Lori. So again, you know, I, I kind of gave our uh, most common household type and size when I said a single parent with one child. Uh, in the most recent reporting month, we had 85 uh, single parent families. Uh, we also have se had 74 adult not included cases uh, for, and uh, many of those are grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles that are uh, providing care for a relative child. And so the payment type for that is uh, it's set different. Uh, again, it was set in October of 1993. So it starts at $452. Uh, for that household type, and then there's $102 added for each additional child. Um, and um, obviously for you know, those household types, we also provide supportive services, but they're not geared so much uh, towards uh, you know, a job interview for the grandparent or anything like that. Uh, we, we're really looking at the child's needs uh, to make sure that they have enough clothing, uh, bedding, et cetera. So those are, it's kind of a different uh, take, but it's, we don't have as many of those cases. And um, in addition to the grandparents, if a parent is uh, disabled, say, uh, like the previous questioner said, you know, if they're fully disabled but they have a child uh, and they receive Social Security benefits, we also pro provide adult not included uh, TANF benefits to those families and uh, try to really help increase their monthly income and help out as much as need in the best interest of the child. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, uh, may I add to that? Oh, please. Uh, also, uh, when we're talking about a grandparent who's, who has uh, uh, care for their grandchildren and they, those grandchildren are receiving TANF, uh, if that grandparent is still low income, uh, they can apply for general assistance for themselves. And uh, general assistance will not look at that TANF money as countable income, so it will be exempt. So there's a possibility uh, that that grandparent may be also eligible for general assistance at the same time. If they, also if they live in, in uh, one of our compact communities. Right. Great. Um, from Johanna Arvin, is this another check for COVID? No, these programs are pre-existing and actually have nothing to do with COVID. Um, I think we're just trying to spotlight during these uh, COVID times so many of our citizens have been laid off or um, remain unemployed so that it's it kind of puts a spotlight on the need to apply for these programs. Um, from Jen Marvin, do we apply every month or is it a one time for mostly utilities? Um, appreciate the COVID put on our utilities as it was high and helped tremendously. Well, uh, for general assistance, uh, you would you would only apply once, and then uh, the caseworker that you're assigned to will work with you to set up a monthly meeting uh, to uh, so they can redetermine eligibility and help you with your uh, individual uh, self sufficiency plan as you work towards self sufficiency. So uh, you don't need to reapply every month. Uh, the caseworker will work with you on continued eligibility. Okay. Um, from Char LeMay Hill, is there an office in Anchorage that I can go to? Um, that would be Cook Inlet Tribal Council. So you, you would have to go to them and, and they are a separate entity than us. Um, from Jen Hartsock, 
Is there a scholarship available to apply for to help? If so, who can I talk to? Uh, you can contact our 1-800 number, 1-800-344-1432, and ask for higher education. Uh, will we have to reapply for the CARES Act if we already applied for the last one? So this isn't a separate, it's just the con that we're able to continue it. So if you've already applied and have not yet got your funding, that, that will be your, your applications being processed. So you do not need to reapply. From Jerry Heisler, is there a list of all the supportive services available to view? Will? Uh, we don't have a list available, but if you're interested in what uh, supportive services we can provide, you can contact us and we'd be happy to talk to you one-on-one uh, -on, -one on that. Great. Um, Tina Johnson, will we have to reapply for the CARES Act if we already applied for the last one? I think I already answered that today. Sorry. Um, again, this isn't a new program, just reopening to continue. Um, from Mary West, if you are 116th native, do you qualify for TANF? We do not do blood quantum. So if you are enrolled or can be enrolled by, um, showing your family history, then you can apply. But yeah, we, we don't uh, consider blood quantum. Okay. Um, that concludes all the questions we got. So I just wanna again, thank everybody uh, for following along with us today. And uh, we hope this was uh, helpful. So just wanna thank you all for tuning in. Um, we'll be randomly drawing and we just did that. So um, today's winners for Hydro Flask are Anne-Marie Wyatt and for Formline T-shirt, Jerry Musa. So uh, if you ladies put in your, uh, if you private message us your mailing information, we'll get those sent out to you right away. Um, so I just want to thank everybody again, Gunchi Shawa, for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something new today about the tribe's programs and services. Don't forget to join us next Thursday, January 14th, and we will um, be announcing that topic soon. Uh, again, appreciate you all joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.